been doing a lot of work on these filters and we know you've all got 600 watt PAs on 23 stems now. So <coughs> are a bit notorious for putting out uh, the odd harmonic. So John is going to tell us how to solve all the problems. John. Thank you, Graham. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to talk a bit about this high power, what I called harmonic filter for 1.3 gigs. Um, requirements. Um, we want to get rid of our second, third and fourth harmonics really. We want 30 dB or so. Particularly second because that's now in the middle of the area that's going being sold off by the government for next generation, fifth generation mobile telephony. So uh, second harmonic radiation would not be a good idea. So uh, try and uh, get as much rejection as we can of, uh, of those harmonics. But on the other hand, we also need to handle potentially quite a bit of power with, if you use the MGM high duty cycles. And ideally it wants to be small, easy to make, cheap. <laughs> <laughs> difficult to do all of those <laughs> so <laughs> so where do we go from here how do we go about doing something that might work I mean there are various different ways we can do it the old traditional low pass filter topology um, losses question mark maybe there are some quite nice um, tubular filters um, um, G3YKI Ken had a very nice tubular filter for 23 SEMs but you do need to have access to a lathe to make something like that, really. Um, so then there are bandpass filters. You can do interdigital filters and things of that sort. Uh, again, how much loss would you get through it? And in uh, running high power through it, you get quite high voltages on the ends of the tune lines. So you've got tuning screws there. You've got to be careful about spacings and uh, potential corona discharge and arcing. So maybe not such a good idea but obviously keeps the signal clean. Um, I know Mike G0MJW if he was here be talking about diplexer filters this is where you divert the harmonic energy off into another bit of the filter and then terminate it in 50 ohms instead of just reflecting it back into the PA. Now um, you, there are some arguments that might be better to do that. Some PA designs uh, like class F and class E actually deliberately reflect harmonics back into the output stage in such a uh, phase to make the thing more efficient. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to uh, have reflected power going back into the system. The amounts aren't actually that great in general. If your harmonic is 50, uh, 20 dB down coming out of the PA, then that's 5 watts at 500 watts. So a 500 watt PA can manage 5 watts of reflected power going back into it usually without a problem. So, um, terminated not reflected, but complexity a bit more. So what I've come up with is what I call a harmonic notch filter, uh, which is fa hopefully fairly simple to make and low loss, uh, but has one disadvantage and that's these, the notches are actually pretty narrow band, so the resulting filter is great if you're operating in the communications bit 1296 to 1297 but wouldn't be any good for wideband modes so that's just a disadvantage of the way that this particular design works. So what does it look like? Uh, there's a stub for the second harmonic at the input which shorts that out. Stubs for the third and fourth harmonic share a common connection and short those two out and the distance between those two points where those stubs are uh, connected acts as an impedance inverter and cancels out the capacitance effects of the stubs at 1296. <coughs> and the rest of the line is 50 ohms for the reflectometer section. So that's what it actually looks like in practice, where this one is a quarter wave on uh, 2.6 gigs, that's a quarter wave on 3.9 gigs, that's a quarter wave on 5.2 gigs, and that's a quarter wave on 23 SEMs, and this bit's the bit that does the reflectometer out to the outside world. Um, I then 
having just come up with a sort of topology, uh, so, uh, simulated it in a program called Sonic Light, which is a free download on the internet. If you Google that, you'll be able to find it. It takes a little bit of learning how to drive it. You have to do all of these things <laughs> and learn how to do that first to uh, get something that actually works at the end of the day. But what you can do at the end of it is uh, get a display that looks like this, uh, which in this case in purple is the, uh, the loss through the filter and the, the blue one is the return loss looking into the filter. So if we just uh, look at those, uh, that's a bit small, <laughs> disappeared off the bottom that one. That point there, for some reason these Lara's moved, is 23 SEMs and we have about 25 dB of return loss looking into the filter at that uh, frequency. Um, this first notch here is uh, about 30, just over 30 dB deep at 2.6 gigs. Uh, second notch here, not quite so deep, maybe a tad short of what we actually really want. So that's uh, 28 dB at 3.9 gigs. And um, we have this one here is an oddity. This is actually due to a resonance in the box itself, uh, which in practice doesn't actually seem to appear when we actually look at the um, pictures. So um, that seems to be something that Sonic predicts but doesn't actually seem to happen particularly. And then finally our 5.2 gig notch is pretty deep and uh, over there and then things go a bit wild beyond six gigs but we're not going to worry too much about that. So that was the, the simulation, what does it look like in practice? Um, the first version, I've actually been in use now for about nine years on my first generation big PA on 23 SEMs. Uh, it's in a big brass and copper box with lots and lots of screws built in sort of what I call traditional microwave manner. Um, cutting the line to the right shape was a, a real pig of a job to do. And it uh, requires a lot of unscrewing and screwing screws to adjust it. <coughs> so <laughs> it wasn't ideal. So I thought, how can we make this simpler? So the new version fits in one of Allen G3NYK standard tin plate boxes. And therefore is relatively low cost housing for it. Um, and it's easy enough to open and close. Basically, the filter itself is built on a, that side. The rest of it's just an empty tin box. And um, you can either solder it back together when you're finished or clamp it in place like you would with a DB6MT box or something of that sort. Uh, so you can get it open and shut and tweak things fairly easily. Um, this one I just opened up then use a solid copper ground plane and a filter line cre uh, created on a milling machine. So I'll pass that one round to have a, have a look at it. But it still meant that you need to have access to a machine shop to do the uh, milling to make that. And it's a fairly expensive lump of copper underneath, 1.5 millimeter copper sheet, quite expensive to do. So I had a further think about it and decided to uh, use a PCB as a ground plane and uh, then also get uh, the filter line made by laser cutting. Uh, I've got uh, a few of those done so I'll pass those around and have a look at how that's been implemented. So if we, there's, that's the PCB top and bottom. So most of it's just ground plane. And this little bit up here is the reflectometer part with the coupled lines here. You'll notice that it's not tin plated. I specifically had to uh, ask for it not to be tin plated to reduce the loss in the uh, area under the strip line. And it costs more to have it not tin plated than it is to get it with tin plate. Um, and the areas around where the connectors go are uh, also not plated. Uh, the green stuff is just the standard uh, solder resist. 
and the uh, laser cut filter line looks like that and it's uh, on its way around. So uh, a lot of laser cutting companies when you ask them will only do things like paper and leather and plastic. There are fewer that do metal and it's a bit more expensive to get done but uh, if you have a, a few done then the pricing becomes moderately competitive. A uh, tin box, a bit of drilling and cutting. Um, one thing about connectors on this, you need to have N-type connectors with flat backs. So this is um, a, a plug, an N-type plug with a flat back, no ridged part to it, so it can go flush to the ground plane. And there's a small flange version of an end socket here. The filter line is actually designed such that that will fit into it. So the hole in the filter line is uh, the right size for the small version as well. Um, but you'd need to re-drill the holes in the ground plane in a slightly different place for the smaller ones. Um, you can get... Uh, I've also bought M females with a, a flat back from Innov Antennas on their website on eBay. Um, so, um, and you can also solder them on to the box to get a really good connection if you've got the uh, silver plated brass version. I'm not so sure about some of these nickel plated ones as to whether they would solder particularly well. So those are the sort of typical sort of connectors that might fit the bill for this sort of job. Uh, that's the inner antennas one that uh, you can buy on eBay for a few pounds each. So in terms of uh, putting it all together, there's all the parts. Uh, clamp the line with bits of PCB, standard 1.6 millimeter PCB underneath to get the right spacing. So it's 1.6 mils over the ground plane. Clamp those in place and then solder the two ends. And uh, then build the reflectometer part, which requires a bit of uh, SMD work. And then it's tuning up time. So how do we adjust it all? Um, first thing, the match at 1296, you can tweak by bending the main line along the main part of the line up and down to the ground plane. And uh, so you can achieve uh, the best return loss that way. So if you've got some uh, access to a network analyzer, you can actually see in real time what's going on with that. Um, or use a spectrum analyzer and uh, signal generator or tracking generator and uh, a return loss bridge. Um, you need to bend the stubs up and down a little bit to get them on frequency. Quite critical. Uh, it needs a bit of tweaking and trouble is it's quite springy as copper so you have to do a little bit of uh, getting used to uh, how to adjust it. Uh, so they need to be done quite accurately. It's best to start with looking fairly wideband on an analyzer at it and then narrow down as you get closer into getting it on frequency. Um, so network analyzer is the easiest or a signal generator and spectrum analyzer uh, which is what I've got at home is how to set it up. Uh, performance. Um, through loss is quite difficult to measure. I actually put it in a series with the noise figure test set because that has a gain uh, measurement um, resolution of 0.01 dB and it was somewhere around 0.05 there or thereabouts on the uh, using that um, but it is quite difficult to measure. Now that's about 5 watts of dissipation at 500 watts through power but actually some of that power is being reflected because if it's a 25 dB return loss that's about two watts of reflected power so the loss element may be only about three watts through that so it's not going to get too hot. Um, and the notches on the frequency you'd hope them to be on hopefully. So this is uh, a plot of the return loss you can see this one is actually slightly better at HF where it achieves uh, the right numbers, probably could benefit from a bit more tweaking. So it's about just over 24 dB return loss at 1296. And if we look at the notches, 
then we're achieving our 30 dB here at 2.6. Not quite so good here, it's about 25, 26 dB at uh, 3.9 and a good deep notch at 5.2 gigs. So um, it does the job, it's just a little bit tricky to adjust it. And then there's a reflectometer as well. Um, the one that's going around has a separate printed circuit board to do the uh, reflectometer part. But now, with the, if you look at the uh, ground plane PCB, it's actually built into that. And it's about 40 dB coupling. So it doesn't have any impact on the main through line and the power dissipated in the sense circuits is small. So uh, that, uh, it's uh, quite a low coupling and it uses 80 ohm microstrip to do that. Um, and a mix of 0603 is now 805 Sydney components to uh, populate it. And it's got voltage dividers so you can match the detector levels that you actually want to achieve so uh, to get the right voltage range. It's actually set up so that it's negative going output at the moment um, which happened to fit with the W6 PQL control board that I use on the PA. Um, but you can actually do a very simple op-amp interface into uh, something like a PIC. So something like that will convert from a negative going input on this side of 0 to minus 5 volts to a positive going input on this side. And the tweaker here will allow you to set the gain to get exactly the FSD you want. So relatively simple to interface. Um, directivity is <coughs> not great, somewhere approaching 20 dB. Um, it probably needs a bit more work on the sense line design, but it's okay for monitoring purposes, certainly for forward power and for uh, detecting <coughs> a dangerously high SWR. And this is it in the final amplifier, so the uh, output of the PA goes in there and it pops out through that right angle connector to the outside world in the uh, final amplifier. So that was, that's a very quick introduction. Dave? John, I know this is a naughty question, but what would you interfere with if you didn't have that filtering circuit? It depends where you are in the country, but if you are anywhere where there's a going to be 5G telephony in the future, you'd like to have 2.6 gig uh, cell sites of okay. some sort and uh, <coughs> so that's uh, part of the problem uh, that you're trying to avoid is interference into cellular systems, fifth, fifth generation cellular systems. Any other questions? Uh, I'll stick something on my website in due course about it and I'll probably write it up for Scatterpoint as well, so watch this space. And finally, that's it. Uh, I've got a limited number of the printed circuit boards and filter lines, so if people want to let me know, I can let you know roughly what that would cost. So, what's the cost roughly of this uh, laser? It works out at about thirteen pounds per piece, roughly, uh, when I'm buying them in ten off quantity. So, um, probably cheaper if I was buy buying more of them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, thank you, John. somebody else rather than the usual regulars on one point three. But thank you again. Thank you all for coming this weekend and we look forward to seeing you in another year.
assuming we can find the uh, people to get us on site. Um, <laughs> but no, seriously, I'm sure we will uh, run such an event again next year. Um, we can't stop at 40. That's far too soon. So thank you very much and have a good trip home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.